So, I'm going to work through some of those painkiller problems that were just outlined in the previous video. So the first question was about the functional groups in the aspirin molecule. We can see that the two functional groups are a carboxylic acid group, attached in the top position there of the benzene ring, and an ester functional group, attached at kind of 2 o'clock. If we then move on and consider the acetanilide, phenacetin and paracetamol, again I ask you what are the functional groups in those molecules? Well, each of them, at the kind of 2 o'clock position on the aromatic ring, has an amide functional group. And in each case, it's a secondary amide. It's an amide, not an amine, because we have the adjacent carbonyl group next to the nitrogen. In phenacetin, we have an ether functional group. That oxygen connects together two different carbon atoms, so it counts as an ether. And in paracetamol, instead of the ether, we have an alcohol unit. And more specifically, if we have an alcohol on a benzene ring, we call it a phenol type group. So this is the structure of ibuprofen. And I said we were going to look at the chirality of this molecule. And we're going to focus on this carbon atom here, which has the wavy bond coming out of it. There are two possible orientations of this methyl group. It could either be pointing out of the board towards you, the viewer, or it could be pointing back into the board away from you. And let's look at one of these situations and draw it accurately in three dimensions. So we can have the methyl group coming out of the board towards you, the viewer. That would leave the hydrogen going back into the plane of the board. Now what we need to do to determine whether this is an S or an R enantiomer is to assign priority to the different functional groups. We assign priority by looking at relative atomic mass of the atoms attached to the chiral centre. So if we look at this unit, we have a carbon attached here, a carbon attached here, and a carbon attached here, and a hydrogen attached here. So this hydrogen is the lowest priority unit. It has the lowest atomic mass of any of those groups. All of the others were carbon, so they're all the same. We then have to go to the next atom away from the chiral centre. In this case, we have oxygen atoms here. Here, we have carbon atoms attached, and here we have hydrogen atoms attached. That means that the oxygens with the highest atomic mass are highest priority, so this will be priority one. The carbon which has carbons attached will be priority two, and the carbon which only has hydrogens attached will be priority three. We then have to orient the molecule so that the lowest priority group is pointing away from us. And we're lucky. With the hydrogen as number four, the lowest priority, it is pointing away from us. It's going back behind the plane of the board. We then look at the groups one to two to three, and we draw an arrow going in that order. You will see that the arrow here is going clockwise. It's a right-handed turn, and we therefore describe that as the R enantiomer of ibuprofen. Now, actually, it's the S enantiomer of ibuprofen that's the active one. So what I want you to do in your own time is have a go at drawing and labelling priority groups and working out the S enantiomer of ibuprofen. Interestingly, ibuprofen is used as a racemic mixture of R and S. The reason for that is that the body is actually capable of converting the R form, the inactive form, into the active form, the S form, using an isomerase enzyme. So it's a good example of a drug where although you need the S form for it to be active, you can in this case safely use the racemic mixture of R and S because the body turns R into the form of the drug that you actually want. One of the questions I asked you was how many chiral centres are there in morphine? Well, this is the structure of morphine. And if we remember, a chiral centre is a carbon atom with four different groups attached to it. If you have four groups on a carbon, it can exist as two mirror images, referred to as enantiomers, and that makes it a chiral centre. So we look at the structure, we have to find the carbon atoms which have four different groups attached. Now, we can ignore the top left of the molecule. This is an aromatic benzene ring, 
And there are double bonds between the carbon atoms. There's multiple bonding. That means that this carbon is attached twice to this carbon. So it doesn't have four different groups attached to it. Let's come down to the bottom left ring and start here. This carbon atom has a bond to a double bond, a bond to this oxygen group, and a bond to an OH. Three different groups, definitely. The fourth group on here we're not showing must be a hydrogen, because we don't show every single hydrogen on the molecule, and that means this must be a carbon centre, a chiral centre. So we can mark it there with an asterisk. If we come round to this carbon atom, once again, it's bonded to a carbon with an OH, it's bonded to a ring, it's bonded to an oxygen. The final atom attached to here that we're not showing must be a hydrogen. Four different groups attached to the carbon, therefore it's a chiral centre. We come round to this atom, it's attached here, it's attached up to a benzene ring, and it's attached over to this nitrogenous ring. Three different groups attached, the fourth must be a hydrogen, so this must be a chiral centre. We come round to this carbon atom here, it's bonded into the ring, it's bonded here towards a bridgehead position with a hydrogen on, and it's bonded down to a double bond, each of those is different. The fourth group is a hydrogen, four different substituents, it's a chiral centre. These two atoms form a double bond, they're bonded twice to each other, so they can't be chiral. Now let's move up to the remaining carbon atoms. Any CH2 groups cannot be chiral, because they're bonded to two hydrogens. Well, this is a CH2, two bonds to carbon, must be two bonds to hydrogen. This up here has two bonds, so the other two must be hydrogen, CH2. This is a CH2 group here, two bonds to carbon, the other two must be to hydrogen. So none of those centres can be chiral. That leaves us just with this carbon atom here, which is bonded up towards the benzene ring, down into this alkenic ring, and out towards the nitrogen. The final substituent must be a hydrogen that we're not showing, therefore this is a chiral centre. One, two, three, four, five different chiral centres. And remarkably, the opium poppy makes this compound with all these chiral centres controlled. Finally, I asked about the conversion of heroin into morphine within the body. And the kind of reaction is ester hydrolysis. Those two esters in the top left and bottom left of diamorphine are being hydrolyzed and they form alcohols. Of course, when you hydrolyze an ester, you make a carboxylic acid, which we're not showing here, and an alcohol. And that's what's left on the framework of morphine you'll see that one of the esters hydrolyzes first to give monoacetyl morphine, and then the other ester hydrolyzes second. If you're an advanced chemist, as an advanced problem, you might like to think about why that top ester hydrolyzes before the bottom ester. It's been proposed that one of the reasons heroin might be more active than morphine, and more addictive even the morphine, is that the monoacetyl form that forms in the body is highly active against pain and causes the high levels of addiction. But that theory is still pretty controversial. One thing that is certainly clear is that because heroin is a bis ester, it's a little bit less hydrophilic than morphine, uh, which has OH groups and is a little bit more water-loving. And so heroin goes more easily into the brain of the patient. It crosses the barrier between the blood and the brain, which is quite fatty, and therefore heroin has a bigger effect in the brain of the patient than morphine. Anyway, I hope you found all that useful. I've got a dentist appointment to get to, and I'll see you all soon.